Hey boys and girls, um, I'm back again and I'm going to be talking a little bit about some of the technology that uh, is going on inside of the Cybertruck. This is um, a little different than what you're normally going to get. I'm going to go through some of the standard things and then I'm going to be talking about some things that are much more specific and a lot more technical. So let's start with the specs, okay? So uh, the price tag is something that everybody's interested in. The spec on the uh, two-wheel drive system is uh, between um, 79K and 88K, depending on whether you buy the extended range thingy. Um, if you buy the Beast, like I was driving around, uh, then um, its base is uh, 100 grand. The range on these things on the, uh, the normal vehicle is 320, 320 miles. But if you buy the Beast, and you uh, get the extended range, you'll get uh, somewhere around um, 440 miles or 470 miles, something like that. Towing's 11,000 pounds. The turning radius is about um, 17 and a half feet. Normal for a pickup truck of that size would be about 23 feet. Um, it can do zero to 60 in 4.1 seconds with the standard vehicle. The other vehicle, uh, the, uh, the Beast, that's uh, 2.6 seconds. Uh, the normal vehicle weighs about um, 6,600 pounds, and the, um, and the Beast weighs about 6,850 pounds. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about things that I, I think are a little more interesting and definitely have um, an advantage over everybody else. And the first one on my list is the going from 12 volts to 48 volts. Now, I, um, I know that people don't really understand this stuff, <clears throat> and, and I think that sometimes graphically it's better if I show things. So let's have a look at what I would get if I was using a 12-volt system. Okay, now this is just representative. This, this is what I would have to use normally with a 12-volt system. This is what I would use for a 48-volt system. Have a look at the difference there, and you'll see why it is a good idea to move from 48, or sorry, from 12 to 48. So let's talk a little bit about what happens when I start fooling around with two things. This is the first, which, um, which I'm really excited about, but then there's another one. So when I was, uh, no matter what company I've ever worked with, I tried to push Multiplexing. Now, nah, multiplexing has some issues. What Tesla has done is gone to an Ethernet ring, a ring that goes all the way around the car, and basically uh, inside that ring, it communicates with the rest of the vehicle. So, in essence, I lose an awful lot of wire harnesses with this Ethernet ring and localized uh, communication. What does it do for me? Well, it, reduce, it does increase speed and it reduced cost, but let's have a look at what a normal harness would look like. Here's one right here. And, tragically, that's the other side. Okay, so what does that really and truly mean if I go to 48 volts? Now, there are some power lines on here. Power lines are usually in orange, but in essence, we're looking at a 73% weight reduction in going to 48 volts and also the 800 volt system. Both those systems combined with the ethernet ring gives, gives Tesla a 78% a reduction in weight. What about the cost? Well, I just showed you some wires here that one is four times bigger than the other. Copper is what costs. So the weight goes down, the cost goes down, the efficiency goes up, and the speed of the, of the product, of the speed of the electricity moving and communicating and doing whatever it has to do is also gone up. So let's, let's think on this because it's kind of ponderous. What else does it enable? Well, if I can trade the weight that I can get rid of becoming more efficient using 48 volts, what else can I do with it? Well, I can do um, uh, the 800 volt charging system and of course, everybody probably knows now that we have, or Tesla has, uh, dual direction charging. So they can suck juice in, 
but they can also now power your house and, uh, and another car if you need to. So what else does it do for us? Well, it enables us to start thinking hard about um, uh, steer by wire. Steer by wire has been around since the 40s, actually. In the 40s, they started fooling around with it, around 1948, 1949. Now it's on every aircraft that's built, every major aircraft. So if we're looking at F-18s, F-22s, F-34s, F-whatever, they all have steer by wire. That's the only way that Tom Cruise could shoot down somebody else, right? So that's kind of like what we're looking at with uh, fly-by wire. Now we have steer-by wire. So what did that do? What did that do? Well, first off, you have to have at least double and in some cases triple redundancy according to Nishta. Okay, that's fine. And that's what they did. And they put it in place. Now, what else does it enable? Well, it enables me to have, um, as I just mentioned, um, steer-by wire but it also gives me the ability to inexpensively give myself steer by wire in the rear. So the Tesla vehicle steers both front and rear the vehicle. So that's kind of common in buses and uh, big rigs and, um, and trailers and some things where you're completely off road and it's really, I mean, you really got to turn quickly. This thing, when it's turning, it's like uh, amazing. I already gave you the radius. It's only 17 and a half feet as my radius. That's, that's, pretty, that's pretty damn good. That's almost the length of the car. At the end of the day, what we're looking at here is something that is dramatically different, that's making a huge difference in their weight, their cost, their ability to perform. I mean, it's just leaving quite a few people in the dust. The stainless steel that Tesla has for that car is austenitic. It's a 300 series steel that, uh, stainless steel that they've kind of like developed on their own. But austenitic means it's non-magnetic. So let me show you a little couple of things. <clears throat> Let's look at normal sheet metal on a car. And you can see that our lovely magnet here, which you can buy if you wish, um, it sticks to it. All right. It sticks to it and it'll always stick to it. But will it stick to aluminum? The castings are made out of aluminum? No. Okay. There's no sticky here at all. So let's look at what happens with good stainless steel. Okay. Uh, anybody who cooks like I do knows what that frying pan is made out of. That frying pan is made out of stainless steel. And I trust the, uh, the people who made it. Okay. Cousinar. They make good stuff. It will never stick. It never sticks because <clears throat> this stainless steel is austenitic. Austenitic means it won't stick. Now, I have a little picture that we're going to be putting up, and you're going to get the, the chance to have a look at three different kinds <clears throat> of um, structural forms. You're going to be able to see austenitic. It's marked. And you're going to see uh, uh, carbides and whatnot. But you're also going to see martensitic. Martensitic is what the Tesla product is made out of. How did they get that? Normally you have three ways of creating martensitic stainless steel. One is to manufacture it, and that just means you're just going to eliminate the nickel. Another is to heat treat. So what you do is uh, you heat it up to about sublimation, quench it rather quickly, and uh, you'll wind up with martensite. And then the third is cold forming, and that is where we are looking, that's what we're looking at with the, with the Cybertruck. What they do is they, uh, they, they receive austenitic 300 series stainless steel. It comes from an uncoiler. The uncoiler sends it into a working press. That working press does two things. One, it flattens it out. The second is it works it, cold works it, so that I can get the, the Martin site to create itself, basically. So it's a work hardening stainless steel. And I'm sure I'm going to get quite a number of people who sit on their couch and say that that is not possible. But I'm going to tell you that you are barking on the wrong tree. I know what I talk about. And that is precisely what they're doing. Um, I, uh, I, I really think that what uh, Tesla has done here is stepped up the game again using 
probably the best material science people on the planet and also figuring out how they can take what is a pretty good stainless steel that won't rust and turning it into something that's hard enough because quite frankly if I take normal stainless steel I could have probably shot through any of the uh, any of those thicknesses with the rifles that I have but I can't shoot through something that's martensitic and that's why when you see some of these rounds hit that martensite or that stainless steel and you see it explodes that's supposed to do that on the other side of the steel not on the front side and they're copper jacketed that's why it's so amazing to me to see what happens uh, with the Cybertruck. Now let's talk about the motors. <clears throat> they look very similar to me. I don't believe there's much change in the electric motors, that, uh, but I can say that for some reason or other, the cooling system seems to be a little more efficient. I know that they scab heat from the, uh, from the battery and the motors and stuff like that, but maybe there's some other trickery that's going on with the octo valve and whatnot. We'll only be able to know that when we do the teardown. Um, and the last thing I wanted to talk about was the castings. So what we need to do here is kind of like get in a little closer because <clears throat> what I'm going to show you is a standard, a standard casting design. As you can see, everything here looks like little squares. And if you look right here, you can see there's cross hatching. And that's what we've been doing in castings forever. When you get a chance to see the Cybertruck castings, all of a sudden everything's changed. Now what you see are sweeping flows. They're, they're totally different. And the reason for that is because Tesla's got a new CFD software system where they have been able to um, identify the fastest, bestest, whatever flow system, and also to figure out where's the best place to put this hatching. This hatching doesn't appear. It doesn't appear like this anyways on the new Tesla products. It's a totally different, um, I don't know what you'd call it, like a natural way, like trees flow and whatnot. That's the same thing and rivers. It's the same thing. It's a totally different way of making things happen. Now, the other thing that, uh, that, uh, that we see with uh, Tesla is they're taking castings. Now, sitting next to me is the, um, is the um, BMW i3. This was the first time that we saw die castings welded to extrusions or welded to other castings. Tesla has taken the rear end of their product, and, uh, and uh, I will tell you, their castings are quite a bit bigger than these, but they've taken and putting one casting on top of the other and welding them. So that I, and by the way, the rear uh, casting is made on a 9,000 ton press, but even though it's bigger than this, this casting here, the, um, uh, the tonnage on that front press is only 6,000. And the reason for that is, of course, because they've developed this new CFD way of getting the job done. So they can take one casting and weld it on top of another, and they'll get a, a really good bond. A really perfect bond actually so these are a few things that we've kind of seen in the last couple of days and I just thought I'd want to try and get these out to you as quickly as we can um, thank you for watching Monroe and uh, Monroe life and I hope you have a wonderful a wonderful evening thanks so much bye